first of the series, um, Parenting in a Pandemic, um, and excited to speak with everybody, hear from you, um, give you some feedback and some helpful um, information about how we can make these Chagim especially meaningful this year. So I'd like to start by introducing um, our guests, um, Shira and Max. So Shira Steinberg Abraham is um, NIVO 1999. She currently teaches at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in their teacher education department. She attended the joint program between Columbia University and the Jewish Theological Seminary, where she earned her master's degree in museum education um, from Bank Street College of Education. His two children, Naama, who is supposed to be in Kochavim this summer, um, and hopefully will be back this coming summer, um, and Lior, who will be um, Ruach Rama in uh, 2022. Uh, and then we have um, Maxine Siegel Handelman, otherwise known as Max. Um, she's the Director of Family Life and Learning at Anshe Amet Synagogue in Chicago, where she leads Tat Shabbat and creates a pathway to Jewish life and community for families with young children, both virtually and in person in this um, environment. Um, she's a Kameen Chala, and she's passionate about chocolate. Um, she is the author of a picture book called The Shabbat Angels, as well as several resources for Jewish early childhood educators. Um, she's definitely a sought after speaker and a professional storyteller um, extraordinaire. Um, she has two daughters, Ari and Yael. Um, Ari was going to be a JC this past summer at Camperman, Wisconsin, and hopefully she'll be back um, this coming summer as well. So, welcome to Shira and Max. Um, we're going to do the overview for um, our session tonight. Um, we're going to start with an interactive activity, which Shira will explain in just a second. Um, then we're going to talk about what are the overarching themes um, for these Chagim, and then how do we take those themes and put them into action? Um, and especially, you know, in this environment with our, with our children, how do we make it meaningful for them? And then we're gonna have a Q&A at the end. Um, since it's a smaller group, we may open it up to share ideas and other things as well. So um, you can certainly send me your questions directly throughout, um, the, uh, throughout the presentation or um, you're welcome to wait until the end and say them in person. So welcome and we'll begin with Shira uh, with our activity. Hi, um, thanks so much, Shelly. Good to see you guys and nice to be here. Um, so Max and I um, were talking last week um, in preparation for this um, event, and we were talking about the idea of Shana Tova, the traditional greeting that is often translated as Happy New Year, or, um, but really the word Tova, good. And in a pandemic, what does good look like? If you had asked, um, you know, your children a year ago what a good year would be, I would assume that they would say things like dessert every day and, you know, a new iPhone. But what does good look like now? Um, and so I'm really curious um, for this group, for us, what does a Shana Tova look like for you? Um, so I think Annie is going to share a screen, and there's a website called um, Mentimeter, and if you go to menti.com, <laughs> I feel like a, uh, you know, commercial here, uh, if you go to menti.com and use this code, you can actually help us kind of create a word cloud together. Um, so we're going to um, keep this up, and as people are, um, as you go there and really share what um, yeah, Annie, does, will you see, there we go. Um, so the, the actual question you're answering, what words come to mind when you think about what a Shana Tova might look like in this coming new year? Um, so yeah, so just kind of keeping that in mind. Um, Max, what do you, do you want to, oh, fantastic, you're going. Um, so I'm seeing normalcy, mask-free, healthy, happy. Oh man, these are definitely things that we wouldn't have <laughs> wished for a year ago. Um, mask free, normalcy healthy, normal activities, peaceful, 
um, joy filled. I'm really happy. I'm really happy to see those, you know, things of joy and happy still here. Um, still what we would look for for good. Max, do you want to, um, is there things you want to, jumping out at you? Um, I'm noticing, well, I actually had a question for Annie. This is my first time using um, this technology, so I'm very excited about it. Um, Annie, is there a way to add more than one word or we each get one word? I would have chosen more carefully if I had known that. It should have given you the opportunity to put in three words, um, I believe. Yes. Okay, and then once you do that, it, um, oh, me... oh no, actually, I think I can just go in and put the code in again, because I was thinking again, yeah. about, um, um, I'm putting in more words, but um, <laughs> um, the, the word that I hadn't put in yet was hug, um, and those are some of the normal activities. Um, joy filled is such a big, um, is such a big term. It's interesting because, because there's some things like, um, no masks that are not accessible to us now. And then there's some things like joy filled that in some ways are still accessible to us. They just, right now, they just look really different. Um, so I think it's really interesting that, um, there are things that we think about when we think of a good year that some of those things we we have right now and some of them um we some of them we don't like togetherness although we have it right here yeah i keep saying to people um and kind of reframing the idea of social distancing that there are so many friends that i feel more connected to um, you know, a lot of my camp friends even that I hadn't maintained such close relationships with pre-COVID um, and the idea that even though we are far apart that um, this really, this pandemic has really um, created a closer community um, in some respects. Um, so it's kind of that shift of mindset um, that I um, really think that we should focus on when we're talking about um, entering the high holidays with young children. Um, things that we would have expected of ourselves or of our children last year um, are, might not be expectations that we have this year. And kind of shifting our mindset um, that things that, um, you know, traditions that we might have, going to synagogue, that might not be a reality for everyone. Um, and so kind of having um, giving ourselves the ability to lower our own expectations of ourselves, I think is a really important um, shift in mindset as we enter this year. Um, oh, I like, those are still building, the word cloud is still building. Um, you know, the ability, the ability to see friends and family, the play dates and travel, those, those are wishes that I would never have really wished um, for a new year. Um, and so, um, you know, I was, uh, yeah, so I think that it's a really good just kind of shift in mindset um, as we talk about what Shana Tova means. And I hope for you guys, as you wish your friends and family a Shana Tova, um, that you really are, you know, meaning that, that it's a good year, not just the platitude of Happy New Year and, you know, whatever, but that we really should wish for a Shana Tova. Um, so thank you for your participation um, with that activity. Um, I also um, was thinking a lot about, um, you know, this idea of lowering the bar and kind of having grace for ourselves. And that really is reflected in our tefillot for, for Rosh Hashanah, right? We talk about, um, you know, El Chanun Verachum, a compassionate God. If we're asking, um, you know, God to be compassionate with us, um, how can we have compassion for ourselves and for our kids um, in this time? How can we, um, so often, I as a, as a teacher um, in, in early childhood especially, um, we talk about this idea of perfect, right? Like there are kids who want everything to be perfect. And I would never expect a student of mine to be perfect all the time, um, yet I often expect that of myself. Um, and so how can we, um, especially now um, for high holidays, how can I um, readjust 
my own idea of what a perfect Rosh Hashanah is going to look like, um, understanding that that's unattainable this year. Um, how can I have the Rachum for myself? Can I um, put, give that compassion back to myself um, to, to really um, adjust our expectations for this year? Um, and, um, you know, helping our kids, modeling that behavior for our kids also is just an important life skill in general. Um, and I think that that is something that we really have the opportunity to teach our kids now that when things don't go your way, um, how do we respond and how can we adjust and course correct? Max, one of the, yeah, one of the, um, one of the things that Cher and I talked about was um, one of the ways we have compassion for ourselves is by taking care of ourselves. And these have been really crazy times where sometimes we feel like we're, we don't have time to take care of ourselves. One of the resources actually that we'll share um, afterwards is, an, is a, an article that helps us think about um, self-care for ourselves as parents, how we think about um, and how we can take very small, consistent steps um, to take care of ourselves and, and um, why that's so important. Um, especially us as parents, when we take care of ourselves, when we actually get enough sleep, when we start the day by brushing our teeth, when we um, take a couple minutes to breathe, how it um, not only helps us to have compassion for ourselves, but also to, um, um, to uh, take care of our children better. And yeah, Steffi, I saw your uh, your note that we are taking care of not just ourselves and our kids, but often our families or our neighbors um, who, um, or our, um, our long and trying to manage long distance and close relationships. So um, there's a lot, um, but when we're able to find moments to take care of ourselves and to have um, compassion for ourselves, we're able to do all of that other stuff a little bit better. So that's part of this season as well. Max and Shira, I think one thing that can be challenging, especially when caring for people and yourself, is that you used to have this community that you could rely on to help you and to provide support, whether it's cooking a meal or visiting or taking your kids for a little while. You know, we don't necessarily have that anymore. So how do we create that sense of community or that togetherness when we don't necessarily have the physical physical piece of that? It's an amazing question. It is. And I think that those, you know, reframing your thinking on that, that, you know, it might not be, um, <laughs> it might not be in your parenting style or whatnot to, you know, clearly we're seven months into COVID. I don't need to talk about screen times for kids. You know, we are all in it. But um, my relationship I know with my nephews who live in New York has changed in that there are oftentimes that I have long extensive FaceTime conversations with them to provide that kind of um, you know, even though I can't take them for the afternoon, um, but relying on, on the technology to, to provide those distractions um, to, you know, the resources that we're going to send you, you know, whether it be PJ Library or some videos on, you know, on Rosh Hashanah topic, just maybe like directing our kids into either um, on topic technology or, or connecting um, via FaceTime with other people. Um, but really just recognizing that um, I value that time with my nephews so much. And it wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't, if we weren't in this pandemic. Um, you know, I was worried that Adam was gonna log on, but he's not. So, you know, they don't like their boys to have screen time. And I value the fact that I have, you know, a half hour conversation with them. Um, so kind of just reshifting that mindset. Um, yeah. I, I absolutely um, agree that we're all doing things that we never imagined that we would do or allow. Um, and then I think also, Tali, back to your, thinking about your question of creating community, um, I think that in addition to 
online and virtual opportunities, we have, um, we have ways to think about how we might um, visit people by, by distance, how we might um, take a walk with our kids um, and, um, and visit people from uh, their sidewalk to their front porch. Um, to have a little bit of that kind of visiting. The weather is not being very kind to us um, anymore, but we, we had a lot of time where, um, where that was more possible, but you know, we have coats and umbrellas. Um, so thinking about, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to go for a walk with my kids in the afternoon after they get home from school, but it will actually help us all care for ourselves if we go for a walk and check in on our neighbor or they can um, play a game of, um, uh, they can play a game uh, that you can play distanced from sidewalk to sidewalk with their friends type of things that we didn't try before that um, are worth the extra energy to create that community. And I also think that there's, there's something to, I know that a lot of communities are doing, um, you know, uh, shofar blowing in a parking lot or whatnot. Um, but I think that there's also something to, you know, inviting your friends over, whether it be on Rosh Hashanah or, um, you know, beforehand or even, you know, during the, during the 10 days between um, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to invite people to your backyard, um, you know, to blow the shofar together, whether it be a real shofar or one of the like really annoying plastic ones, but to like kind of create those memories. You know, like, what did you do when you couldn't go to the synagogue to hear the shofar blast? We invited our community in. Um, you know, we can talk about the halachic permissibility of hearing the shofar via Zoom or not, and if you want to do it in addition to, but blow the shofar on FaceTime for a friend across the country. Um, you know, kind of create those memories. Um, for the kids that we didn't just sit here and say, okay, I guess it's Rosh Hashanah. We're not going to do anything. Do something. You don't have to do everything, <laughs> but find that one thing that works for you and your family. And um, really, that's what the holidays are all about. And, and Max and I were talking about this last week, about how as parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles that we are giving our kids these Jewish identities by creating these memories. Um, there are so many Rosh Hashanah <laughs> holidays from my childhood that I'm not going to be able to pinpoint the year of when that happened, but we are going to go look back on 2020 <laughs> and say that was the Rosh Hashanah when, and what we do in the next few weeks is really going to um, be that story that our kids are telling for generations, um, and that's not to put pressure on it. But that's to say that even though we couldn't do this, this is what we did do. We invited all of our friends over and we blew shofar in our backyard. This is the year we couldn't do a big tashlich with everyone else, but we found the ravine in the back of whatever and we did our own tashlich. It's, those, it's that memory making that if we can focus in on that, that we're really providing our kids these wonderful stories to tell for years. And who knows? I mean, this could be the start of a new tradition, right? You know, I keep thinking about, you know, you go to the grocery store, if you all are going to the grocery store and there's those plexiglass things up and I keep thinking, when are they gonna take them down? And the answer might be never, this might be the new normal. So what's to say that chauffeur blowing in different parking lots across the city might not be the new norm going forward. So it's interesting to think about what new traditions we could make starting this I've, year. I've been thinking a lot about um, uh, about just that. What are we going to keep? And um, so I actually made my Rosh Hashanah Chalas already. My mom used to make Rosh Hashanah Chalas for her friends. So my mom is gone. So I make Rosh Hashanah Chalas for her friends and my friends. And I add blessings. And the blessing this year, part of it was, um, may we uh, may we keep the things, the, may we keep the best of the things that we learn during the time and may we recoup the best of the things that we've lost. So I think um, we don't want to wrap our brains around it, but, but we all acknowledge that, um, uh, that there are things at, that we're learning and doing now 
that will stay, like playing code names with our friends across the country and things like that. Um, um, and and so it's, uh, I think it's interesting and useful to watch ourselves now and think about what are the traditions here that we're going to want to keep. Maybe we're always going to have a Seder um, on Zoom. I mean, not right now, but maybe we'll always have Seder on Zoom with our families across the country. Maybe that really worked forever. Um, and maybe, maybe we won't do that. Um, one, of the, um, one of the resources that we're going to give you, which you highly likely have seen, is this PJ Library um, High Holidays at Home. This is not in color. They have it in color. Um, and there's, so it's a, it's a big, huge 50 page guide. It's a little overwhelming. Um, during the course of this time together, I'll point out one or two things that, um, that are really, I thought really interesting. And one of the things um, that they added here was on um, the holidays, we say Ashamnu, um, where we think about all of the things that we, um, that we did that were, that were mistakes that, or, or sins. Um, and this is a positive Ashamnu. So um, I know you can't see it, but um, it has things like, we grew, we made beautiful things, we laughed, we accepted. Um, and this, this concept of turning the Ashamnu around and making it not things we did that we don't want to do again, but things we did that we want to do again. Like we demanded fairness. Um, and so this is a tradition that I would love personally to add and keep doing. That's really great. I love that. That's great, Max. We'll send all of this stuff out after so that everybody has it for sure. Um, great. So think looking forward, you know, into the new year, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, what can we, what can we tell our kids? What can we talk with our kids about, you know, when you talk about a Shana Tova at the beginning, Shira, how can we talk to our children to make sure they know that it will be a Shana Tova, and we're confident about that. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I really think that you can ask them the exact same questions that we were asking at the beginning. What, you know, what do you think of? Um, I'm really curious what your kids would say, um, you know, and, and name it. Say, you know, what would you, have asked, what would you have said to that a year ago? And, you know, talk about the differences of, of how you know, things have progressed in, in our, in our year. And I, I think that Max said it well, that, you know, in the positive Ashamnu, it's not just the global pandemic that we're living through. Um, you know, when we say demanded justice, like there's a lot of other really big things going on in our world right now. And so how can we, um, say like our positive wishes for the world, um, our positive wishes for the year, um, they would really look different um, given any one of these global <laughs> crises going on. Um, and there's so much happening all together. Um, but just naming it with your kids and saying like having that open conversation with them. I also think it's really important um, to talk about how like, um, especially like as a, <laughs> I felt really energized, you know, however many months pay ago Pesach was. Um, and when, when Max was mentioning um, the, you know, keeping the virtual Seder, um, I felt really energized in April, you know, doing all the things, setting up the Zoom. I feel very depleted now. <laughs> um, and I think that just naming the fact that like Pesach is a holiday that we normally celebrate at home. And Rosh Hashanah is a holiday we usually celebrate in community. And how is that going to be different this year? And having that conversation with our kids and letting it come from them. What do you want to do? Um, I know that in the Sephardic community of Rosh Hashanah Seder is, is a tradition that many families have. Um, maybe that's something you want to adopt this year, to have a meal um, with a Seder that works on Zoom, um, however you want to incorporate that into your life. But having, um, just 
even just naming it for kids because they're feeling something is off this year. And if we can give them the language, especially younger children, to say, this is different, right? We on Pesach have that built into our ceremony to ask, why is this night different? We don't normally ask that now, but we might need to start asking that and just naming it for our kids. Um, to give them some sort of control and se um, semblance of normalcy as well. I, I love that. I love the thought of, of also asking, why is this night different? Um, now at Rosh Hashanah, um, it, it, it works so well. Um, while you were speaking, Shira, I was also thinking about the fact that the conversations that we have with our children are going to look different if our children are eight or nine or even a little bit older um they they can think about things much more abstractly so they can think they can really think back to last year what was different what were their expectations that are not going to be met this year what are the new things that are being added this year how can they help to create um, the situation that they want this year. Um, slightly older kids can really think about that more. And younger kids, our fours and fives, and even six and seven-year-olds are dealing with a lot of feelings that they can't name. They can't, they may or may not remember what happened last year for Rosh Hashanah. So they're, they're a little bit more um, they're a little bit more lost, and with, with those kids, we can focus a little bit more on just how they're feeling and how they might have some control in this situation, because they're living in a world right now where they have no control, and I've seen that have really hard um, uh, behaviors for a lot of kids right now who have no control and no real way to think about what they're going through. Um, and the PJ Guide, actually, I'll pull out this one more um, idea for you. They have a really nice um, idea in there about how you can help your child role play, a, a younger child. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this with your eight or nine-year-old, um, unless you know your eight or nine-year-old really well. But definitely your four or five-year-old, um, 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 taking some stuffed animals or some dolls. Or, or Lego figures or whatever it is that is meaningful to them um, and helping them with, with um, some role plays. So, um, you know, setting up the stuffed animals or the Legos or whatever and, and talking about, you know, elephant is really, is, is living alone and is feeling lonely this Rosh Hashanah. How, how could we help elephant? What could we, what could we do? Um, and those types of role plays, which is a really amazing way to help your younger child um, think about and, and deal with all of the stuff that's happening right now. Probably not just for Rosh Hashanah, but for other things as well. I love that idea, Max. Um, and one thing, one other thing I thought about <laughs> as you were talking. <laughs> I'm just borrowing them. <laughs> I love it. Um, we definitely want that resource after this. It's um, in the list was um, about, you know, kind of creating, like looking at what we did last year and how it's different than what we're doing this year and maybe flipping the switch and saying, you know what, we, we can't do what we did last year, but how can we make it better or newer? You know, we can't have Bubby's chicken soup this year because she lives in a different state, but let's make our own chicken soup. She's gonna send us the recipe and we're gonna try to replicate it or we're gonna make our own new thing or we can't have the hurkala, so let's figure out a way to make the challah. You know, taking something that maybe would normally be a sad thing, like we can't be with this person, and then making it into something that um, that's more fun um, and makes it a little bit more positive. Um, the other thing that I'm doing, oh, sorry, Shira, go ahead, and then no, I'll talk. I, um, the, it makes me think of the, one of my absolute favorite um, early childhood educators, teachers that my kids had, um, they came home with a, you know, sheet of what they did in school that day. Uh, I think my nine-year-old was two at the time. And, you know, on the list it said, we lost our Shabbat bag today. 
instead of you know our Shabbat tablecloth, we used this. And instead of our candlesticks, we made them out of Legos. And I think that that is such an amazing, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up because it's, it's not the joke anymore, right? Like we can't go do these things. And so how can we create a parallel? How can we, um, and this is something that Max and I also talked about last week of creating these parallels without pressure, right? Like how can we just say, okay, this is what we want to get at. We want to have something new, <laughs> right? We want to start our new year to say Shachianu, to have a new fruit. But you know what? Instacart doesn't have pomegranate listed on their thing and so instead I'm going to buy mangoes or whatever fruit you haven't bought on Instacart yet this pandemic and call it that parallel right like our um in early childhood education it's called backwards design like what's the goal and then you kind of build the backwards from that. Our goal is we want to have a new fruit and say shachianu for the new year and so how can we take that and make that parallel. So I really, really appreciate that you were bringing that up. Um, the other example that we had thought of is, um, you know, a lot of times people wear new clothes for Rosh Hashanah, maybe just wearing nice clothes, <laughs> period. Putting pants on might be enough to say Shehechianu. Um, and so what are those traditions that we want to parallel um, and, and to incorporate into our Rosh Hashanah this year? Definitely for me, putting on clothes will be a Shiaqiani moment for sure. Um, fantastic. Great. So what are, um, I don't know if we want to kind of open it up to questions a little bit or comments. Um, do we want to talk about any more ideas or ways that we can kind of take some of those ways to make the Chagim special and meaningful and put them into more concrete things that we can do. We've kind of been talking a little bit about that along the way. Um, and then what are there like support systems um, or things that we can use like the PJ library book that might be able to help facilitate some of those um, ways to make things meaningful. And Shira and Max, maybe for you, and, and I, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know the room in terms of ages, but can we talk about like younger versus older kids, kind of like what we just did, because there may be different things that we want to do for different age groups. So I think it might be useful to, um, to talk a little bit about, just to share a little bit, some concrete examples that Shira and I had been, um, and ideas that Shira and I had been kicking around um, which will still leave us enough time for everybody to type in and ask for more and different things um, than what we've put on the table. Um, so Shira and I talked about um, um, kind of three, uh, two, two, two really different big ideas. Um, one big idea being what might, what might parents do before the holiday to get ready um, and then what are some ideas um, for kids um, to be involved in while parents are sneaking in a little bit of um, virtual uh, services for themselves so um, so we're going to share some ideas in both of those realms um, right now so, um, so one of the things, and again, um, I, I want to offer everything that we say in the next however many minutes um, on a cushion of no pressure. So we are all maxed out and trying to do one more thing might just be, um, that's the word. But, um, but maybe something we share will actually spark a little creative juice that you have a little energy for. So all of this is offered on the cushion of you don't have to do this, um, but, uh, but maybe it will help make your life better and not harder. Um, so the first thing we, we talked about are um, thinking about um, the fact that, as Shira mentioned before, typically we are um, in, in synagogue for the high holidays. And so we don't have to do much with our homes. We might have to clean up if we've invited guests for a meal, but otherwise like 
um, that's not a, a thing. And now if we're going to be in a situation where we are attending services virtually, um, then we might want to think about the space that we are going to do that in. Um, and it could be as easy as just throwing some extra floor pillows in the um, in the room so there's comfortable places for people to sit and move around and stand and 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 sit. You might want to cover the table that you put your laptop on with that nice tablecloth that you were going to serve guests at. Um, uh, so little things like that. Um, just to think about where am I going to have these services? Where am I going to be engaging in the high holidays? If we're going to be streaming um, or watching family services, do we have enough room for um, for my kids to get up and dance? If they or for me to get up and dance with my kids? Um, so just thinking about what is the space going to look like, and how can that add to your experience without also adding to your stress level. That's the first thing to think about. Shira, you were going to talk, talk about cooking. Oh, I just, I put that note in because we, I was, uh, I was amazed that Max and I had an entire conversation about a Jewish holiday and we did not talk about food. Um, and so I put a note in our little um, notes that we needed, we need to include food in it. And, um, you know, getting before the holiday also. Um, I know that, um, you know, just making those round challah out. If you've never made challah before, you know, maybe this is the year to do it. Um, there's so many, you know, videos of how to braid challah, you know, during quarantine, um, you know, to, to do that. Um, I usually, um, <laughs> I usually make applesauce for Sukkot. Um, and this year my kids were like, well, let's make it for Rosh Hashanah. So we spent the, you know, um, Labor Day, we went apple picking and we got apples and we made applesauce this year. And so that's, we're having that for, for Rosh Hashanah as well. And so those, those, um, memories and, and those food, like what we were talking about before about that memory making is maybe as Max said, we are, or Tali said that we can't have, Bubby's chicken soup this year, but maybe this is the year that Bubby gets on FaceTime and Zooms or, and, and shares that recipe with us. And no, you need to put a little bit pinch more salt. And when I say a pinch, it's really whatever it is that, you know, creating those memories through food. Um, it, it, I mean, it's, it's a no brainer, but kind of making those, making it meaningful, right? So often I know I, <laughs> before a hug and just, you know, stressed and crazed. I have a whole, you know, house full of people coming over. And this year that pressure is gone. And so how can we kind of take something that has been a source of stress in past years and make it actually something really wonderful to pass on to our kids this year? I will say one will say thing one about thing. around Hala, um, and that is um, if Thinking about making challah is 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 very stressful. There is there is um, an option in between buying challah and making challah, and that is kineret challah. I don't know if you've ever seen the little box in your freeze in the freezer section of the of the grocery store, um, but at Rosh Hashanah time um, they sell around challah, and kineret is a frozen challah that you buy and you take it out of the box and you let it sit out for like two or three hours and it rises and then you bake it and your challah and your house smells so good. Your house smells like the holiday. So it's that really nice step in between making it from scratch and, um, and buying it, buying it's fine, but if you want to, if you want that smell in your house, which is part of that memory making, um, and I will just vouch for the taste. I grew up on Kinar Hala all throughout the year, and it's delicious. So I'm not getting paid for this, but um, good option. <laughs> also, round Hala is so much easier to make than braiding. You just put it in a little rope in a circle and put it in a pie plate. Yep. That's my theory. Okay. 
Um, yeah. Do you want to, uh, Max, do you want to talk about things to do on the day of that when you, when you mentioned this to me, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to need to find things for my kids to do if I want to actually do any davening. Um, so I really appreciated you bringing that up. Yeah, well, it was kind of brought up to me by parents who asked, what am, what am I going to do with my kids while I'm trying to attend services? So that's a, that's a real thing that we all share. Um, so there's, there's certainly always the virtual option. If you have more than one device in your house, you can be attending services while your children are watching, um, you know, ideally Rosh Hashanah related material. Um, and there are some links to BIM bomb videos um, in the resources that we're sending you. And there's lots of, there's also some stories that, um, from, that I did and there's other stories as well. Like PJ Library has lots of recorded stories. So there's, there's lots of um, stuff on the internet if, you, if that is a good option for your family. Um, so that's certainly one thing. Um, there's one of the other resources in the, um, in the resource list is a, um, a family resources guide that Anche Emmett put together, um, which is really fun because it kind of dovetails really nicely with the PJ Library one. We didn't even plan that. Um, but so one of the things um, in that guide is, um, is a suggestion about how your kids can use loose parts to create high holiday related scenes. So loose parts is a fancy early childhood term for things you have laying around your house. So it can be, there it is, there's, there's fancy loose parts. My class today was on loose parts, which is the only reason why I have this. We did not plan this. <laughs> <laughs> so loose parts are anything. They are the, the containers from the eggs that you use between now and Rosh Hashanah. They are marbles that are laying in a drawer. They are um, craft materials that like got stuck in a cabinet. They are bottle caps or really whatever. It can also be real building materials like Legos and connects and, and uh, magnet tiles and things like that if you have those as well. But um, so it takes a little bit of preparation um, for you to kind of gather some loose part materials together. And Shira just showed us some really nice containers. Um, and you could use Tupperware um, as well to like to organize the, the loose parts. If the loose parts are all jumbled together in one box, it's kind of hard for kids to like be creative with them. But if they, so you, you elevate their creativity when you're able to give them loose parts in like, you know, a Tupperware of pen caps and a Tupperware of, of toothpicks and whatever. It just kind of adds to their creativity, but no pressure. You can throw it all together too. Um, but if you gather some loose parts um, and then you, um, you know, print out this page from the guide, which is in the resources and say, you could see what you could, can you make a shofar out of these materials? Can you make the story of Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain? That's for slightly older kids. Um, can you, um, can you, we're going to go do Tashlich tomorrow afternoon where we throw bread in the river. Could you use loose parts to make our family doing Tashlich? So you can set your kid to creating things um, with loose parts that, you know, could occupy them for easily 15 or 20 minutes. Even more. And Even one more. of the, I mean, it's really funny that, that this was totally unplanned. Um, um, I happen to have here from, because I did not clean up after my class today, um, muffin tins are really great ways to categorize and organize them. So even if it's not just on topic, after they, after they build the Tash thing, they might want to organize um, or, you know, kind of categorize, um, especially younger kids, like, you know, either by color, by size, by texture. Um, and so that's a really great um, time. <laughs> um, but it's also what I like to think about with those, and I love how you phrase them on that sheet, is invitations to play. Um, and so, you know, the can you, it's not make, it's not build the, you know, it's not build, make the river. It's how can you um, 
it's, it's more of a question for them. How, how do you see us making Tashlich tomorrow? Um, and, and I love the, the phrasing that you have that it's really these invitations of, you know, can you make a shofar? And if they can't, then they're doing something else and they're, and they're still engaged and you can still have your 15 minutes. Right. And, and sometimes even more, it really helps kids think through um, what's going on with the holiday and what their interpretation of the story is. So if you do lose parts with your kids um, or if you, you know, set up loose parts for your kids, if you can also take a moment um, after you've had your time and they've been building and the question as the parent is not, what did you build? Because um, that's like this question. But your question as the parent is, tell me about what you made. Or tell me about this. You don't even have to say what you made, but just tell me about this. And that is a big, wide, open invitation to your child to say, this person is doing this and this person, and I thought about this, and I was wondering this in the story. Just tell me about this, is your invitation to your child to like stories, um, which is also amazing memory making. So. That's fantastic. Thank you guys so much. I want to open up for ideas and Q&A in just a second. I wanted to ask, because um, loose parts could be for all ages, what about, how can we make, you know, like kind of the young teen, like old, you know, nine to 13 year olds, what would be something that might pique their interest that they might not want to stand and dive in? Are there questions we can ask them? Are there books or stories or something to engage them in what is Rosh Hashanah? What is Yom Kippur? I, quick, I, any quick ideas for that age group? Um, it's a loaded question. question, maybe. Loaded question, sorry. <laughs> Um, and, and you've gone outside of our, our expertise, um, or at least mine. Um, but I would say just thinking about um, my children and going through those years, that some of my most successful moments were, um, and again, totally depends on the kid, um, but sometimes asking them to take a small leadership role or a small teaching role. Um, especially if they're in religious school or they're um, in day school, to be able to say, um, uh, not to pop it on them, but to say, when we're um, when, on the day of Rosh Hashanah, I'm hoping that you might teach our family something about one of the tefillot, one of the prayers, or a story that you're learning in school. Um, and even very young kids can do that, but older kids can do a, a little more. Um, teaching and engaging. So sometimes that works for, um, for some older kids to be put in that leadership position. That's a great idea. Perfect. Yeah. I'm also, I'm thinking about also like how we document this. Like, I, I don't, I don't have an answer, but I'm just, as you're asking the question, I know that, um, you know, that age really likes, you know, whether it be the social interaction, social media, and while we're not necessarily doing that, depending on your family um, and your traditions on the day, but how can we, you know, not just create these memories for our kids, but how do we like document them to say in 2020, <laughs> this is what we did for the high holidays. And so maybe posing it to them and maybe they want to make a video if that's okay with you, or maybe they want to do something to, to really say that this is, this is a, a different year um, and, to, and to document it somehow. Nice. Love that. Um, okay, great. I want to open it up to questions. Um, if people want to ask anonymously, feel free to chat me directly um, or you can unmute yourselves. How is everybody planning on spending the Chagim? Are you gonna be just in your immediate family? Are you doing anything outdoors with extended family? What are people's plans? Virtual services, is anyone, I know there's a couple shuls in the North Shore that are doing some socially distanced in-person things. 
what are people's plans to make it meaningful? Everybody's shy. It's a hard question. It's a hard question. Don't really have the plan set yet, but got some great ideas after tonight. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah. We don't really have specific. We have, well, we talked with um, two families about maybe having a picnic on one of the days. But yeah, I'm like, without the idea of going to synagogue, I'm a little stressed about like, oh my God, what do we do to mark this day? I thought about, do we go for a hike or do we, um, I don't know, somehow, because I just, this whole thing, it's just, it's, it's so strange and it's just us. We're not really with other people. And um, so I feel like it, it is a lot of pressure, I feel like, to, um, yeah, make sure, yeah, to make sure they remember it and in a way that is, and make it meaningful. And so, um, and I'm not usually very creative when it comes to <laughs> these kinds of things. So I'm happy to listen to this conversation and get ideas. So I will make Amy, one more, I would like, oh, go on. I will make one more plug for the, um, for the PJ guide. Uh -huh. um, uh, and uh, just that um, one of the things that they do in that guide is they take, I think, five to main to feel out from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. um, really break it down and make it family friendly. So if you're thinking about let's just, you know, we're not going to turn on screens, um, but we want Rosh Hashanah to be somewhat prayerful. That's actually a really useful resource because um, okay. it makes it very accessible. Okay. Uh, one thing I think that um, I'm going to try and do is um, instead of just preparing or our, our food like we would for a, a simple meal or a, a, a hog meal, um, following along the whole Zoom theme of things, the way life is operating now. Um, we've, we're aware of a couple different like um, honey cake or um, baking Zoom classes that are going on like this, this weekend. I think Chabad is doing and my, at my daughter's school, CJDS is doing, I think it's a honey cake bake. So I'm not even sure what they're baking, but I made sure to sign up for it because when you're participating through the Zoom, you still feel like not just doing it with mom, she's doing it with like classmates and part of a bigger group. And then she has this special cake that she made. We'll put it in the freezer until we, Rosh Hashanah comes and then we'll take out this cake. So I think it sort of um, can, can build up to the Chag and make it um, a little more special and significant because we um, started a week before, it's a way to start getting things going with an activity that's that's involving the community, even though you're on Zoom. That's a really great point too. That you know the the social aspect of it is that you know really young children might not be able to grasp the concept that other people are also living through this. Now that schools are opening and whatever your kids are doing or not doing. Um, you know, it's a little bit more apparent to them that everyone's living <laughs> through this. Um, but kids don't really have the self-awareness to really understand that other people are going through this as well. So I really like that you're bringing that for, for your kiddo to say, like, look, other kids are, are doing this. They're going to be on the Zoom too. Um, and, and to Amy, I would just say that um, don't worry about, don't put the pressure on yourself to make the memories. The memories are going to be there right? Um, and if you can kind of say, like, this is going to, this is what's important about Rosh Hashanah, um, and to make that parallel without giving yourself that pressure, um, because the memory is going to be there, and right. just making sure if it's a hike, that's what we did, Yeah, and yeah. That's gonna, maybe that's going to be the thing that you carry with you, and that, mm -hmm. you know, from, from now on, you go on a hike every Rosh Hashanah, but that as long as you name it and say, this is what we're doing to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, mm -hmm. that memory is going to be there. Okay. Jacob, I think you had something to say if you unmuted yourself. 
Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jacob Citron. I'm the executive director of uh, our camps. Um, I, I wanted to share, um, there's this lovely Hasidic story um, that I won't bother everybody with, but the, the punchline of the story is that um, we can, uh, is that these Hasidic rabbis were able to accomplish miracles merely by telling the story about how their predecessors actually did miraculous things to accomplish miracles. And this is building off, you know, um, part of what uh, both Max and Shira have talked about, but I think there's something about us telling our kids stories about what Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur were like for us growing up and bringing our parents and our grandparents and our cousins into that space um, and getting together with multiple families and being able to pull those stories. Um, and then thinking about what's the new ritual, what's the new minhag that we can create for this family that we're actually gonna do every year moving forward. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I, I have a tendency of being very heady <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I, I work mostly with um, high school and college kids. Um, and I think elementary school kids can really appreciate this. And whatever else is going on, making that simus that your grandmother made um, is enough. And telling those stories and um, bringing all of that together um, can be a way that I think will, A, make the holidays more meaningful for us as adults um, when we can't go to synagogue and can't be in community. Um, and we'll also give our children a sense of what is special about this day um, you know, other than putting on uncomfortable clothing um, and going to synagogue for apples and honey. Well said. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I'm going to wrap up with one final thought. Um, and I just, Max is putting the link to the Google Doc in the chat if you want to click on that now. Um, and you're able to, we'll also send it out after, but just so you can um, kind of have it up on your screen um, to reference whenever needed. Um, the final thought I have is um, along the lines of what Amy was talking about, you know, it doesn't, not everything has to be on our shoulders. I feel like one thing that could be really great is speaking with your children about what they want to do for the Chagim, what would make it special for them, what are things that they've been learning about in Hebrew school or, or day school or whatever that would make them feel like it's a great holiday for them. Have them direct the day. Um, obviously, you might need to give a little input. Playing video games all day might not be the best way to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. But if they can pick a few activities from a list or something that you put together that would make them feel special and a part of the day, um, it takes some pressure off of you to plan everything. Um, and also they feel included and, and like they want to participate. So um, that's kind of my final thought. Um, I want to make a few announcements before everybody goes of some upcoming activities and programming that we have. Um, and then maybe I'll let Shira and Max um, say maybe a final thought if they have one as well. Um, so we have a Kabbalah Shabbat this Friday, um, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Rabbi Josh Warshawski will be playing some tunes for us. So it'll be a great way to welcome Shabbat. Um, there is a Zoom link on our website. Um, continuing with the series that we have um, started tonight, um, there's another event on um, Tuesday, September 15th at 8 p.m. Central Time, making the most of the Jewish holidays for children across the learning spectrum. The conversation is specifically geared um, on children ages 10 to 18, including those with learning challenges and special needs. Um, and then on Thursday, September 17th at 8 p.m. Central, we have parents, children, and God in the Liturgy of the High Holy Days. Uh, Jacob Citrin, um, who you just heard from, along with Natalie Blitt, a veteran Vermont educator, will lead a discussion about how the liturgy um, of these holidays speaks to our identities of, as parents and our relationship to God. Should be a thought-provoking evening if you can join us. Annie, did I get everything? Did I miss anything? Perfect. Um, Max and Shira, if you want to give um, some final words of wisdom, if you have any before we say goodbye, I want to say a huge thank you to you two. I think this was very enlightening, um, super helpful, both at a high level and very concrete ideas for how we can all have meaningful Chagim. So thank you so much.
Thank you. I just want to wish everyone a uh, really Shana Tova, um, you know, more than ever. It, uh, yeah, uh, may this be a year filled with health and friends and hugs and, and things that we've learned and things that we get back. Well said. Shana Tova, everyone, thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll join us for some other nice learning events in the coming uh, week. Take care.